Good morning from Jerusalem. Those of you who are on the WhatsApp chat got that incredibly red disk sun, but now it's hiding behind the clouds. But I think we will see it before we're done. Uh, I think, I hope, <clears throat> uh, because there's not too much cloud there and it should be moving eastward. So I think, but maybe there's not too much movement. I'm going to have to watch that now. And there we see the Dome of the Rock, the iconic symbol of Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives with all its towers. People are off to work already. It's turned 6 o'clock, 6.30, but 6.45 now, probably 6.40, 6, between 6.40, 6.45 in the morning. There's Hebrew University up on top of the hill there. It has also other campuses here in Jerusalem. And there's Jerusalem now as the waiting for the sun to appear again. There's Mount Zion with the big towers and the Dormition Monastery, the De La Salle School, looking towards Bethlehem, just behind the corner of the school there on the right in the middle of the screen, and straight down to Bethlehem. And then we have the King David Hotel, the YMCA Tower, all these landmarks. Uh, here in Jerusalem. The chief rabbinate is behind that pine tree straight in front of us in the center of the screen. You can make out a little dome there. And then we have the city hall here behind us and Notre Dame here in Jerusalem, the former Italian hospital. I think it's Ministry of Education now with the tower. And here we are. And the bells are ringing, so that's very nice. And there comes the sun again. This time it's golden. Seven or eight minutes ago it was red, red, red. I'm going to have to try earlier. You see, Jerusalem is fooling me a little bit with the uh, sunrise because we're so high up and we have a different perspective. So actually it's visible here much earlier than it is in Magdala because we're so low there. We're, we're minus 200 and let's say where we walk usually, let's say 200, 210, 200, 210 uh, meters under sea level. And here we're almost like 800 meters over sea level. So that's a kilometer distance of height. And that makes a big difference. And if you can see the sun over the hills rising, right? So that's our situation here. And I miscalculated that the last couple of days and the sun is rising earlier than I had just uh, calculated, just figured. So here we are, we're going to do a short little one this morning because we might have more for you during the day. We're going on a community outing and if there's something special and an opportunity to do so, I might give you a surprise live stream with a, a, a tip on the WhatsApp list. Uh, it's, it will be attached here in the, um, in the attachment to this post. And so let's just turn now for a few moments to the readings. Today we celebrate a person who knew Jerusalem very well who actually knew the high priest. He was uh, connected into the high priest's house. We know that from a detail of the passion of Jesus. And um, uh, he was at Calvary when Jesus died. And he was one of the first into the tomb right after Peter. And he saw the clothes folded, uh, the, the face cloth folded up and laid beside the burial cloth. There's a lot to say about that. And then, uh, at the Calvary, Jesus said to him, Behold your mother, the one who had just given birth 33 years earlier, is now in a way giving birth again, becoming mother to a disciple. And this the beloved disciple is taking her as his mother into his home. This has become a major motif <coughs> for hundreds of millions of Christians since the very early time, since I, we could say the, the first time when John took her into his home. I mean, imagine afterwards how they would like to have met with her and talked with her. And Luke says that he researched very accurately the account he gives in his gospel and in the Acts of the Apostles. So what sources would he have to give us all that he does about the Annunciation, about the issues with Joseph? We have that in Matthew's gospel as well. So it was, um, uh, these are all wonderful clues about the very first community. Imagine 
where would the disciples have been staying? Maybe they were staying still at the upper room, maybe not because they had just had that for the supper. But we know they gathered there as well afterwards because the Last Supper had become such a powerful spot for them. And that's over beside the big tower there in the center of the screen. And then maybe they were staying in the Mount of Olives, which is typical for the Galileans. And to run from there, like yesterday when I did the sunrise stroll and chat for you, you can go back and check it out. I came out here from Notre Dame. I went down the, up the street here a little bit, around the corner here of the old city, all along the western side. And then I went in at the, at the um, Jaffa Gate. I went inside, which is, let's say, over there behind the Latin Patriarchate. Uh, you see where, uh, actually where this mast is around there. And then I went, uh, continued um, southward toward the Dormition Abbey and I went out at the Mount Zion Gate and that's where we started the sunrise stroll and chat yesterday. And then during the sunrise stroll and chat, and I wasn't going, I was going walking faster than I normally do, but I walked down the perimeter, the outside of the old city, outside the Dung Gate and down to uh, the corner of the Alexa Mosque, which is uh, over there behind the domes of the Holy Sepulchre. You can't see it very well right now. And then as far as, um, as far as Gethsemane, that's where I ended the, um, above Gethsemane, I ended the, um, the sunrise stroll and chat for you yesterday on the Facebook. So I did that in a short time. What was it, 15, 18 minutes? You know, and I wasn't going like fast like running. So Peter and John ran to the tomb. So if they're in the Mount of Olives, they could run up here to the tomb in seven or eight minutes. You know, just imagine this is where that happened, people. That's the gospel we have today. And then Peter went in and he saw, he saw what was there. He went in and then John went in and he saw and he believed because he saw he was there already at the, at the crucifixion. He was there at the burial. He was there with Mary the whole time. She probably said to him, hey, John, just stay with me. She just, she probably even didn't say, didn't say anything. She just grabbed his sleeve and pulled at it and kept him with her. And then when he walks in on, into the tomb on uh, Easter Sunday, then he has, uh, he, he gathers all that he has seen already from Good Friday evening. He was one of the last out. He was probably protecting her head so she wouldn't hit her off the, off the entrance, which is very low. You have to stoop and she's grieving. She's just watched her son being crucified and now buried, her only son. And the darkness for her, the, the pain, the sorrow. And there's John and he comes back in on Easter Sunday morning and then we have all that good news, the resurrection. John is such a witness for this, it's amazing. It's really the first documented case of how the belief came to be in him, you know, in, in a person. Um, all the psychological, the seeing, the... the um, reasoning, the taking stock of things, and the gift of faith inside, which is supernatural, which is from God. Faith is a gift. You can't make faith. You can't calculate into faith. Okay, you can do a lot of reasoning, which is very good, uh, to, because it's a faculty God gave us to reason, and we can see why our faith is so reasonable. People can put objections to us, and we can work with our reason, but we should also work with our prayer and our faith, obviously. That's where the real punch comes. So people, um, this is the story of John. He said, what we have touched and seen and believed and heard. Look at those readings. It's amazing. This is the joy of, and this is all about the incarnation because God became man. He's not ethereal. He's not just up in the air in the sky. He didn't hit us by a laser. He really came into our lives. He really came to save us really through a family. Yesterday we had the feast of the Holy Family. He came in like that into our lives uh, to renew us, to, to look us in the eye, to hold our hand, to dry a tear, to put his hand on our shoulder when we're down, to lift us up. So continue enjoying Christmas. The radio stations might not be playing Christmas music anymore, but that doesn't matter. I mean, it's, it would be nice if they did. But we have uh, eight full days of the octave of Christmas. That's a very powerful liturgical week, eight full days. And then we have the, the 12 days of Christmas, like the famous song that goes to the 6th of January. And actually the Christmas season liturgically finally ends in, on the 2nd of February. So there's a reason for that. It's 40 days afterwards. These are all biblical things. You know, this is not just a fantasy of some, 
some weird uh, church guy, you know. This is all uh, biblical, all biblically uh, developed, f founded from the very beginning. So people, I want to wish you a very continued joy of the nativity, of the incarnation of that Jesus that he, whom he saw, touched, heard, gathered his emotions, he, he, he picked up on his eyes, on his look, uh, he was real, he saw him eat, he had his feet washed by him, you know, this Jesus is the one he announced, and this is the one today is still being announced from Jerusalem to the whole world, here from the empty tomb, right here, in the center of the screen. So people, God bless you. See you later, alligators. So good to be with you this morning here on the 27th of December. God bless you, see you later. I'm wrapped up this morning, it's about three, four degrees Celsius. So that's maybe under 40 degrees Fahrenheit. I'd have to calculate later, I'm not doing that now. God bless you, see you later, alligators. Thanks for all the sharing. A lot of more people saw this couple of days here in Jerusalem. I understand people love Jerusalem. So continue sharing. Check it out, people, all of you who are just checking in now as I say goodbye.